All right, fasten your seatbelt, gang. We have got a great podcast episode that I am so excited to share with you. We're going to meet somebody new who is a podcast listener, who also has just written a book and is a fellow North Carolinian over on the other side of the state. In this episode, we're going to meet Samantha Fay. She has just written a book on dreaming. It's called The Awake Dreamer, Lucid Dreaming, Astral Travel, and Mastering the Dreamscape. So we're going to talk about the book, but also we're going to talk about her journey, which, as she describes right from the beginning, began from a dream that then led to intuitive development. So I know a lot of you are wanting to separate the monkey mind from the intuitive mind, and you're wanting to step into a more intuitive path. Well, between the book and this interview, this is going to be a treasure trove of information. So enough about that. Let's meet Samantha Fay. Samantha, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and talk about dreams and how to really start connecting with your consciousness on all levels. Man, I have been looking forward to this because, you know, really straight up, let me ask you the first obvious question that anybody talking about a a new book on dreams would have to ask the author. Are we just living in a big dream? Sometimes I think we might be, right? Maybe our (laughs) dreams are the reality. And what we're doing right now is all in the matrix and makeup and magic. I don't know. Maybe it's all a dream. Oh, Wouldn't boy. that be fun? I think a lot of people are thinking, just wake me up when this is over, you know? <laughs> yeah, maybe we should say sometimes it's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> well, such an appropriate topic, and this is going to be a great exploration. In So first of all, let's start at the beginning. Tell us about yourself. Sure. So I've always been a very active dreamer and I've always been intuitive, but I spent a good chunk of my young adult life denying that and just trying to fit in and be normal. And then in the early 2000s, at the, I had gotten into crystals and that's a whole nother story, but crystals just randomly popped into my life. And that discovery led me to Reiki, which led me to meditation. And that's what really amplified my dreams. And at the time I was married to a police sergeant, we had two little girls. And every time I would close my eyes to meditate, I would see this image of someone getting shot in the neck. And I thought, well, that's not good. I don't think this meditation thing is working for me. So I stopped meditating. And then I started dreaming it over and over and over again. And I know it's a gruesome image and I'm sorry for any listeners out there, but I I couldn't stop dreaming about this. And so I told my sisters, I told my friends, I told anyone who would listen. And about three weeks after that occurred, my husband at the time was indeed shot in the neck in the middle of the night, um, July 29th, 2005, trying to apprehend a criminal. And I think it was when we were in the hospital and I was with his family and my family and my friends and my friends kept saying, oh my gosh, this is what you've been dreaming. And I thought about all the intuitive and crazy, wonderful dreams I had had my whole life and how I'd always just pushed it down, trying to be normal and not be the weird one with the big imagination. And so I just kind of creeped out of that little ICU waiting room and I found a chapel and I just got on my knees and I said to God, all right, if you want me to be this weird intuitive, I'll do it, but you've got to make that man live. You know, just that's, that's the bargain I struck. And uh, it was amazing because nobody thought he would live. I mean, Monsignor Matt from our church came and gave him last rites. Uh, The police were talking about the college fund for widows. I mean, it was, it was bad, but he did eventually live. He did come out of the coma. He does suffer from a brain injury but he is completely fine other than a really bad short-term memory and is able to help co-parent our three wonder, our now three wonderful daughters. And so I thought, okay, God, you held up your end of the bargain. I'll hold up mine. I started taking intuitive development classes and it just unfolded so naturally from there. And eventually I gave up my very beloved and secure teaching job and started doing this full time. And I still feel weird and I still I still feel like I don't fit in, <laughs> but that's OK. What a gripping story. And, you know, the piece that I know a lot of people can relate to is I hear so many times from our listeners that they feel like they have that intuitive piece in them, 
but they don't know how to develop it. How did you yes. go from the dream that now is all of a sudden is a reality in front of you in the ICU to where you are now? Well, I do think it started with meditation. I really do. It's it's something I resisted for so long. It's something I still resist. I mean, I never, ever wake up and I'm like, I cannot wait to sit in silence today, you know, because that's not, I'm a Gemini. I'm going to go, go, go and talk, talk, talk. But I really forced myself to do that. And at the time I had three very little children. I had three kids in four years. I had two dogs, three cats, a goldfish, a hamster, you know, you get the gist, right? I had no time in my house. I had no space in my house. I was trying to work and take care of a brain injured husband and kids. And I still made time to meditate. I, I put a little filing cabinet in my closet and I put all my little saints and angels and crystals on top of it. And I would put a pillow in front of the filing cabinet and I'd carry the baby monitor with me. And if I could get five minutes in or 20 minutes in, I think the key was that I showed up every day you know, just showed up to the filing cabinet and sat there in, in silence and just allowed whatever would come through. So if worries and anxieties came through, I just sat with those. But usually some really fantastic insight would come through. And I noticed that I didn't have to really do anything. It was just putting myself in that energy of allowing. And then I would find myself, you know, at a store waiting in line and I, I would see um, a health and holistic magazine that would tell me, oh, well, there's a class in town. There's a speaker up the road talking about mediumship or crystals or Reiki or what have you. And I started following those little synchronicities and signs. So I think that's key is to start with meditation and allowing and have a little mantra that works for you. For me and in, in, in my upbringing and background, it was God, use me to do your will. But you can replace that label with any label that works for you. But I think when we put ourselves in that position of just surrender and allowing, you know, what is my purpose? What is, what is higher spirits purpose for me? Use me to do your will. That really helped me get into that attitude of allowing. And then I took, I took a lot of classes and some teachers were great and some not so great. And I really recommend if you want to be intuitive, you've got to get out there, whether it's online or in person and interact with different teachers. Everyone has a different way of strengthening and opening their intuition. And you've got to find the one that works for you. I also studied a lot. It helped me so much to read the biographies of well-known intuitives and spiritual leaders and thinkers and mediums and look at how they developed it. And then finally, I started to trust myself. That's not an easy thing when you're dealing with the world of intuition, but I would, I would write everything down that I got right. I would write everything down that I got wrong too, but I started to notice patterns in how I was working when I was getting information correctly. So it's not... There's no hack for this. It's not overnight. But I think if if people are committed to really developing their intuition in the way that works for them, it will come through. And it, and even if it doesn't come through in your day life, it's going to sneak out into your dreams. All right. I know this audience of Subconscious Mind Mastery is falling in love with you right now. So oh. <laughs> you have a podcast. Tell them how to find your podcast. Yeah, I have two podcasts. One is called Psychic Teachers. I've been doing that with my friend Deb Bowen for over a dozen years. Um, and we talk about all sorts of stuff connected to intuition. We're both former college teachers and we're both intuitive. So that's how we came up with the very unique title, Psychic Teachers. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> but what's fun about that podcast is I'm a Catholic, she's a pagan. And so we teach from this vantage point of it doesn't matter what you believe. It's that we all find common ground. That's the key. And so that's what we always try to, to model and demonstrate. And my other podcast is called Enlightened Empaths. I do that with Denise Carell. And that's more about how to deal with being an empath, with feeling everything, with learning to set healthy boundaries, with learning to work with your shadow type, your archetypes, and really understanding what does it mean to be an empath in today's world? Great. And I know we're going to um, have a little exchange and be on yes, your podcast, wait. so that will be fun, too. But I just wanted people to lock on because I know they're saying, oh, my gosh, how can I find more on her? Because your story is just so incredibly connecting and gripping. Thank you. Tell us about the awake dreamer. 
So I wrote this book because, as I've said, I've had these dream experiences. As I developed my intuition, they really started to morph and change in very spiritual ways. I started having what I call my night school or astral school dreams, where many nights a week I was taken to, I don't know, I, I describe it as a school on the other side. And they were the same kids in that class as me. We were all adults, but we, you know, we were all students. We would, I would usually wake up in the dream, kind of like a lucid dream. And we'd be standing in line outside of a classroom and there would be a different teacher each night. And he or she would check up our, our name and we'd go in the classroom and, and we would learn things. We would learn how to work with the energy of crystals, how to send and receive healing. We would learn how to transform negative thoughts. Uh, we would learn how to cross over earthbounds every night in these astral school dreams. It was a different lesson. And I've never shared these with anyone. I felt very silly, you know, talking about that. I'm going to school at night in my dreams. It just felt odd. And then I started having all of these, I call them my Oceanside Cafe dreams, because I would have these dreams constantly that I was either walking past the ocean or sitting at an Oceanside Cafe and I was giving readings. And I thought, well, maybe that's just my subconscious way of practicing, you know, what's coming up for me. So I didn't, again, I did not share any of this on my podcast because I felt a little silly. And then I started getting emails from listeners saying, I know this sounds weird, but I feel like we met. I was sitting with you at a table. It felt like the ocean was behind you. Or I'd get another email saying, Samantha, I've been listening to your podcast for years. So maybe that's why I dreamt this. But I think you gave me a reading at an Oceanside Cafe last night. And by the time a handful of those came in, I thought, uh oh, something weird is happening here. I think. I think maybe something is, maybe my soul is actually traveling to a another dimension that I'm not aware of. And so I started sharing it on the podcast and then getting more emails. So all of that led me to research dreams. What is happening to us when we dream? What is the point of dreams? And I came across so many other people, well-known, highly regarded people who had very, very many of these same experiences. I mean, in the holographic universe, for example, Michael Talbot talks about, he writes a whole passage about going to an astral school on the other side. So I kept coming across people who had had very similar experiences. And I thought, well, there must be other people out, out there like me who are having these dream experiences and aren't really talking about it because it feels kind of kind of strange and different. And so that's how I started putting it together. Now, most people probably would say, I don't know, most, that's categorization, but a lot of people, myself included, have a hard time remembering dreams in the first place. And you're talking about some really vivid stuff here. So what's yes. the gap there? How, from those of us who can't remember much of anything, and you say, oh, wow, it's been a long time since I can even remember having a dream. So the gap there is a couple, there's a couple of things. I mean, science will tell you if... If you are stressed out during the day, and that could be a constant worry going on in your life, it could just be a normal stressful day, and your body is releasing more cortisol than it normally does or than it needs, that's going to inhibit all these areas in your brain that help trigger dream recall. So if you're stressed out, you're not going to remember your dreams. If you are distracted before bedtime, you're not going to remember your dreams. If you drink alcohol before you go to sleep, which is a depressant, or you smoke, which is a stimulant from the nicotine, both of those are going to affect dream recall. If you have just that type of physicality to your day, you know, maybe you did like a really strong workout or you had to help a friend move, your body's going to be so tired, it's going to hold your soul close to itself and you're not going to remember your dreams. So there's a lot of different reasons why we don't remember our dreams if you um, fall asleep to TV, it is said to inhibit your ability to remember dreams. However, there are so many things you can do to change that, to switch that around. And, and that's the whole book is filled with exercises and prompts to help people do that. The last chapter is just focused on how to remember your dreams. But I think one of the best things you can do is start thinking about your dreams, reading about dreams, talking about your dreams. That one's tricky. You're going to have to find friends who. <laughs> really want to hear about your dreams. And I got to tell you, I've got a lot of great friends and I only have maybe two who actually want to hear what I dreamt about. And I think one of them is just being polite. So maybe create a dream circle or a, like a dream book club 
or just find that one friend who will indulge you and listen to your dreams and get in the habit of writing them down. People resist this, but if you consistently write down, even if you wake up and you remembered nothing, that's fine. Write October 1st, remembered nothing. <laughs> And that's okay. But if you get in that habit, you're going to start to prompt your subconscious, hey, this is important to me. I want to remember my dreams. And, and another great one is just to write a question down. Like if you are stressed out and you're not remembering your dreams, write a question down that would give you guidance on that stress and tuck it under your pillow. Read it every night to yourself before you go to sleep. Put it back under your pillow. And in about 10 to 14 days, you will have a dream that gives you guidance. Wow. This is incredible. What a, I'm so glad you wrote this book. All right, I'm, l let me review this list a minute because this is really interesting. So stress, you said, there were several things. I, I listed stress, what you're doing before bed, alcohol and tobacco, if you had a big day, and then you mentioned TV, all areas that could affect dreaming. I'm just looking at my own self here because this is something that very interesting. Okay, stress, yes, before bed, um, pretty good on that one. No alcohol or tobacco. Having a big day. Yeah, that's like every day. And then TV, I don't even have one in the house. But you, we've got that phone and the iPad and whatnot, which I would imagine is exactly the same thing, right? Yes. Anything that emits a blue light is going to affect your melatonin production, which is going to disrupt your sleep cycle. What period of time would you suggest before we go to sleep that we eliminate the, the blue light, the blue rays devices? It's not much. It's not much. Re dream research is showing one hour. If you give yourself just one hour of nothing before bed, but meditation or reading or journaling or some light yoga, anything that just kind of grounds you and connects you back to yourself, just one hour. And also, if you really want to remember your dreams, something else research backs up is if you take a, a pretty hot bath about an hour to an hour and a half before bedtime, Something about the changes in the body temperature helps reduce stress drastically and, and promotes a much better sleep where you'll remember your dreams. Our dreaming only happens when we're in that third stage of sleep where we hit the REM cycle. And so if you're constantly being disrupted in your sleep, whether you're a mover, you turn around a lot, you shift, maybe you've got dogs on your bed, maybe you have a baby in the house waking you up. If anything like that is happening, or even I know people who are, their hearing is so sensitive, if their AC kicks on at 2 a.m., they'll, they'll wake up. And so anything that startles you awake throughout your sleep is going to prevent you from getting to that REM cycle. And there's, there's no way you can remember your dreams unless you hit that REM cycle. This so is it, it fascinating. Is, it is something you have to work with, but I think it's important because we spend a third of our life sleeping. That's a long time. And I'm not saying, you know, on your podcast, you talk so much about being conscious throughout your day. And I feel like I'm coming on and saying, hey, heads up, everyone, you got to be conscious while you're sleeping, too. There's a whole other dimension here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. OK, so let's talk about that then. And I love that you've researched this. So this is fantastic. Where do we go when we dream? And I'm talking like you mentioned in the book, astral plane, um, astral school. Where do we, does something in a piece of us separate from our body at night? I think so. And, and really the research I did backs me up on that. Now, I don't think every night we do that. I think some nights we just sleep and rest our body, mind, and soul. But I do think we are these three separate parts, right? And I think that our our body obviously needs to rest. Surely our mind needs to rest. Most of us have that monkey mind overthinking going anyway, but our soul who's always connected through that silver cord to the other side and, and the creator's energy never needs to rest. So I think the soul does leave our body many nights and travels. And I don't know exactly where this is, right? I don't know. I know that for me, I've had shared dream experiences where I'll be doing something and I'll see a friend, I'll see a coworker, and I'll talk to that person, and they had the same dream the night before. And that's only happened to me three or four times. It's very, you know, it's not common for me, but some people it is more common for. To me, that's our soul meeting up on this dimension. But I've had several fantastic and very healing dream experiences with loved ones who have gone before me, and I feel like we're in a different dimension. 
many of those times. I feel like we're meeting in kind of a, a go-between place. I think Rudolf Steiner called it something in Latin. I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but there is a there is this dimension that many believe exist where we can kind of meet with people on the other side. And so I think I think, you know, if you look at Robert Monroe's work with his astral travels or even Sullivan Muldoon to go back even further, they talk about these different dimensions on the other side. Uh, Emmanuel Swedenberg talks about levels of the afterlife. So I think there are many, many places that we can go and visit on the other side. And it's just absolutely endlessly fascinating to think about and, and experience and study. All right. Now, <laughs> we're taking this deeper now. Okay. So you're, you've talked about precognitive dreams where you saw the, the situation with the neck. Didn't connect all the dots. You didn't know what was going to happen. Obviously, you would have told your husband at the time not to go to work that day. Right? I you, did. I did try that. <laughs> you are taking today off if 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 we only knew. Yeah, and no, then, I did try that. He didn't listen. He didn't listen. Well didn't. <laughs> see guys, you need to listen. Especially when you if you guys have a wife who is awake and perceptive, listen to her. Just stop arguing, period. <laughs> we argued. And I said, you have to, he, he said, I, I've got my bulletproof vest on. And I said, my dream is showing it above the vest. I'm fine. He thought he was bulletproof. And you know what? Maybe he was because no one knows how he survived that. <laughs> Still here. So it was all part of a plan. All right. So yeah. precognitive. And then there's lucid dreaming where you talk about being awake. And we've been talking about sleep dreaming and astral plane and traveling and all that. Wow, that's a lot. I mean, so three different ways that we can tie into a perception beyond ourself, right? Yes. And, yes. and what would you say is primary for you? Well, I, I think for me, it would be, I think this is why I wrote the book, because I'm not really sure how to answer that. When, when you study lucid dreaming, what they tend to talk about is this idea of being awake in a dream. But if you look at like Stephen Labarge's, Labarge's work, for example, a lot of his dreams are very Jungian in that there's archetypes, there's symbols. There might be a, a bear who walks through and shakes his hand and he knows that means he's got to work on self-care. I'm just making that example up. But do you know what I mean? Whereas I have these lucid dreams that aren't, archetypical at, at all that I feel like I'm actually somewhere else. However, I am still aware that I'm dreaming. So I, for example, I have these experiences a lot where I wake up in my bed, in my bedroom, and I know that I'm dreaming and I know that I'm awake and I'll go out into my living room and someone from the other side very often is waiting there in my living room to talk to me and I'll have a conversation with them. And then I will walk back into my bed and, and then I'll wake up. Now, is, is that a lucid dream or not? So I, I would, to me, I call it a soul travel experience. And I don't know that anyone else calls it that, I don't know. <laughs> but that's the most predominant. And I think that's the most common if, if people could really start to remember their dreams. Wow, this is incredible. Good reason to get the book. Uh, have you done an audio book? Yes, it is on Audible, but um, because I'm, an, I'm a new writer, they wouldn't let me narrate it. Really? Which bothered me so much because my, my podcast listeners, they're just like, they're just like another family. They're so supportive, you know, and they were like, we want to hear, we, we know your voice. So, but no, someone else narrated I've it. I've never yeah, it's on heard Audible. of that. Wow. Really? Yeah. Because I did, I, I thought, but I did one back in 2016, and I narrated it. But I don't know. That's wow. That's interesting. Well, I'm glad you have Maybe it out. They didn't on all like platform. my voice. Oh, come on now. <laughs> we'll get you in the audiobook narrating business for sure. You've got a great voice, and you're a Gemini, so you're a natural, right? So there you go. Sometimes. No reason not to. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, lucid dreaming. Again, for those of us who have never done it, should we think that we are deficient? Oh, no, not at all. 
I think that everyone should consider trying lucid dreaming. It's it's really not that hard. Here's one of the simplest methods to see if you can have a lucid dream tonight. If you normally wake up at 7 a.m., just set an alarm on your phone for 7 a.m., set another one for 5 a.m. And when that 5 a.m. alarm goes off, turn it off. Do not hit the snooze. Just turn it off knowing you've got the 7 a.m. coming right around the corner and fall back asleep. Studies have shown if you wake yourself up during that last third of your sleep cycle and then fall right back to sleep, you will remember your dreams and, and have a lucid dream experience. And here's another really wild lucid dream exercise that has been shown to work, which I I don't really understand why it's been shown to work, but you know, whatever, I'll try it, right? So the exercise is as you lay in bed, keep your eyes closed. And it's always good to close your eyes and look up a little bit into your third eye chakra. It activates that center and do a reverse review of your day. So start with your bedtime routine and like meticulously, I brushed my teeth, I flossed my teeth, I washed my face, I put all my face creams on, you know, you go through your whole, I got my pajamas on, I took the dogs out, go to what you ate for dinner, go to what you did in the afternoon, you get the point, like a very meticulous backward review as you're falling asleep. And for some reason, that has been shown to trigger lucid dreaming. Now, do you use this back to the precognitive thing? Do you use this for guidance through the day? Yes and no. I haven't been able to fully control the precognitive dreams. Like if I could go to bed every night and say, hello, I would like to have a dream about three events that will happen this week. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Wouldn't it though, right? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't really work that way. But what I will do is, you know, I record my dreams. I used to keep dream journals. Now I keep them on my phone because it's just easier to open up the notes app and hit the microphone when I'm still half asleep and just record it that way. And going back over those dream notes has given me a lot of good insights into things that are coming my way. And so it, it's not, it's just not as one, two, three, right? Sometimes I have to put together, oh, this dream plus I woke up hearing this song and then on this day, I didn't remember anything, but when I got in the shower, I did remember, or I did feel very excited or happy about the week. And I don't know why. And then you look back at that weeks of dream dreams that you had and you realize, oh, this was all pointing to this fantastic thing that happened on, on Thursday. Sometimes it's in hindsight. Wow. You've got a story in the book about a, actually a murder being solved. Yeah, there's actually, I only included that one, but you know, there's actually a, several other murders that have been solved through dreams where the deceased victim would come back to like their mother, for example, and, and tell them who had killed them. But I included this one because I found it absolutely fascinating. A respiratory therapist working in a hospital in Chicago was murdered and everybody loved her and they could not figure out who would want to harm her and whoever had killed her then set her apartment on fire so there was incredibly little evidence to go on and so she she was a respiratory therapist from the philippines and she just passed away and everybody mourned her well another healthcare worker at that same hospital also from the philippines but never knew teresita you know just knew that everyone loved her knew that this tragic thing happened to her she started having these recurring dreams where Teresita Tabasa was coming to her and telling her exactly who killed her, gave him his, his first and last name and how he did it and everything. So eventually she and her husband went to the Chicago PD. And, you know, can you imagine that? That'd be terrifying. Hello, detectives <laughs> who have seen it all, done it all, been there, done that. I've been having a dream and I think I can solve your murder. That's very, very brave, but they did it. And to the to her credit and the detective's credit, they listened to her and they said, OK, we'll look into this guy showery, but we need something more to go on. Can like they basically said, can you go dream more? <laughs> you know? Seriously, so really? They looked into this guy showery that she had named and he was a custodian at the hospital. And when they asked around, it turned out that he was the last person to see her. She had asked him to come over to her apartment and fix, I think, her washer or dryer. And so they were like, huh. So then this uh, woman had another dream where Teresita came to her and said, he stole my jewelry and gave it to his girlfriend. 
So she took that to the police and the police asked Showery's girlfriend, hey, can we see any jewelry he's given you recently? They took photos, showed it to Teresita's family. Yes, that's her jewelry. And boom, he was arrested and convicted. Wow. That's yeah. incredible. I, I wonder if law enforcement is opening up to this more. They are. You know, I, um, I work a little bit. Not so much anymore, but I used to work a little bit with law enforcement and I do some work with private investigators. They will work with intuitives from time to time, but they'll just never talk about it. <laughs> you and I both believe the same thing. We are on a soul journey, right? Our soul is here to grow. This life is a lot more than like kind of like we were joking in the at the beginning. Just all the daily stuff is kind of a Matrix-esque kind of dream, right? And there's yeah. this real business going on below the surface. And one of the things that I think we are kind of on the precipice of is the separation between the folks that are serious about this and the folks that have been casually playing around or dabbling around with spirituality, if you will. And you mentioned in your story that with the three young girls and the dog and the cat and all the, you know, everything else that you had going on in your home that you were committed to grabbing five minutes if you could. And it almost seems like this area around dreams is a whole new dimension that we should explore to open up that realm for ourselves if it's not a tool in our toolbox. Agree? Yes. Yes. And I think that what happens is that during our dream state, our defenses are down when we're not caught up in that dailiness of living life. And so more can get through to us. So why not take advantage of that time? One of the first experiences I had with this astral soul travel experience, I woke up in my bed and there was an older gentleman he looked like a farmer. He was wearing denim jeans and a denim shirt and it had a red baseball cap on. And he said, hey there, darling, how are you? And, and I couldn't talk. I was so terrified to find this older gentleman in my room. But he, even though I was scared, I knew he was safe. Do you ever have that dichotomy in your dreams? Mm -hmm. And he said, come into your kitchen. I want to show you something. And so I just, you know, like a sheep followed him into the kitchen in this dream. And my kitchen was filled with people. And he said, go on, darling, just shake their hand. They just want to show you something. And so I, I sh as I shook each person's hand, I was instantly transported to the last three to five minutes of their life on earth. And I did this all night in this dream. That's how it felt to me anyway. As I shook everyone's hand, I witnessed their last moments on earth. And then the older man who told me his name was Red, he said, you can call me Red, darling. After I had shook everyone's hand, he he walked me back to my bed and tucked me in, put the covers under my chin. And he said, thank you so much. He said, some souls just need a little push to get to the other side. And he said, we need a medium like you to witness their last moments so they know they have actually died and they can fully go into the light. And he said, now, was that so scary? And I said, no. And he said, yep. He said, we've been trying to come to you for help with this for years and you wouldn't let us. Your fears wouldn't let us. And I came up with this idea because in a dream, it's not so scary. That is such <laughs> so a cool I, story. I think that that's what happens to us so much is that we might be committed to the spiritual path. We might be committed to conscious living, but we're afraid or filled with doubts. And so dreaming is a really good way to at least start overcoming that like Marianne Williamson's quote, right? You might just be more yes. powerful than you realize. Exactly. Did this book come from an inspiration in a dream? No, that would make a really good story, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, but separating the conscious from the unconscious too, right? This was something yes. that you, but I'll bet you did have a pretty good intuitive green light or maybe even some synchronicities. To move forward I with sure it. did. You know, when I think when something is meant to happen, it just kind of flows naturally like that. And at that time, I was studying more about the unconscious and the collective conscious. And so it all just kind of came together beautifully. And I presented it to my editor and he was like, great, let's do it. So that's how that all came about. But I, I do feel that we've, as a, as a collective, 
something has shifted. I really do feel that. I had this really profound dream in the first few months of the COVID lockdown where I was in this giant cathedral. I mean, it was it was like where a giant would live. I don't know how to describe it. It was so big. I was like a tiny, I don't know, like a 10 inch person in this huge cathedral. And there was this big organ playing music in the back of the cathedral. And my guide walked with me up to the cathedral and he's up to the organ. And he said, this is the organ that plays the music that makes the universe go round every day. And then he took me into this room that said closed and it was all these file cabinet drawers and it had all these piano keys is the only way I can describe them. And each drawer with these piano keys had something on it like joy, success, happiness, challenge, block, fight, argument, uh, whatever. And he said, every night our souls visit this cathedral and we add our own personal note to the universe to, you know, predict our, our day the next day. And then he took me to this room next to that closed one with the pre-printed notes. And it was just millions of people at like these cafeteria tables and they were writing their own symbols and words on their own piano keys and adding them to the this, this universal, you know, musical instrument. And he said, we've entered a new time where we can take charge of the energy that sings the music of our day. And so was that a lucid dream? Was that a real experience? I don't know. But I do think for me, it gave me this, this awareness that we are all shifting into a higher consciousness where we're starting to realize that we really do have a lot of say-so over our day, over our lives, over our spiritual path. Wow. From your dream to God's manifestation. <laughs> <laughs> May it so happen, right? Right. So have you had any more dreams? Let's explore current reality for a few minutes. Have you had any more dreams about, I mean, we've been through a pandemic. Now we're going through this very conscious shift of, I don't know. You know, we're recording this. Let's just put a, a marker down on September 9th, 2022. And just yesterday I saw that the Schumann resonance chart, you know, that measures the Earth's frequency, the server where it's done in Tomsk, Russia, is down, and it's been down twice this week. So there are these gaps in the Schumann resonance. It would be like if this audio wave file that we have here recording us had just had these gaps in it, right? And I noticed that yesterday, and so there's a Schumann resonance group on Facebook, and I jumped on there to see what was going on, and basically the consensus was it's down, <laughs> you know. But people wow. started mentioning that – they, over the last just 48 hours, have been having this sinking feeling, feeling sick all of a sudden, and that it was mostly related to upset stomach, like coming from nowhere. So I put on our podcast Facebook group the same question, and I think there are like almost 30 responses to it today. So here's this out of the blue, who knows what's going on. As we're recording this, we have a Mercury retrograde happening today and we have a full moon tomorrow, you know, and these little pieces in this puzzle that since 2000, I think we are in this different reality, you know, have you been getting right. any additional kinds of prompts? Well, yes, I do want to talk about my dreams, but I have to say that is so weird because I often fall asleep listening to that resonance. I find it very grounding and calming. If I've had a stressful day, I will play that in my AirPods it, and it just helps me fall right to sleep. And I'm not kidding. Just last night, my my two I have two daughters still at home, one's at college. Our stomach has been upset. We talked about going to the doctor after school today because we've all had upset stomachs this week. That is freaking me out. Amazing. I mean, yeah. I, I saw it on the one group and asked our group, and then here you are. I actually was feeling not myself yesterday. I wouldn't say that I had an upset stomach, but I wasn't feeling myself. Okay, so. ours We described ours as feeling like someone was twisting the inside of your stomach and, into knots. Wow. Almost like an anxious feeling you get before the first day of school, you know, like, but not butterflies, more of like a, like a twisting. And we all three of us had it. And we were talking about everything we ate this week and we couldn't, we couldn't put our finger on it. Anyway. That's okay, amazing. So, wow. 
I do want to say that the year before COVID really hit, I kept waking up many, many nights with this phrase going over and over in my head, something wicked this way comes. I even reread Bradbury. I'm like, what, what is this? You know? And I had this like doom and gloom feeling for quite a while. And I talked to a lot of my other intuitive friends and they had it too. I really thought it was something more, I don't know. I kept focusing on, on China and, and Russia. I felt it was more that. And then COVID happened and I was like, Oh, this is a global, like, you know, this is a thing. But I'm happy to report, though, that in, in the last year, my dreams have really shifted in, in a much more positive way. I've had I just feel very I feel much more hopeful, even though the news is awful. And just I, ta- I have to take big news breaks. I really do. <laughs> I love to stay up to date on current events, but I still have to take like three days a week where I don't look at any of it. But my dreams do tend to run in themes and cycles. And for the last year, I've had these amazing dream experiences where I'm in this huge movie theater and there's always one person in the center alone in this theater, but not alone. They're just the only person viewing the movie and there's angels around them and there's always two humans. So it's me and someone else. And I know that the person sitting in that center of the movie theater is still alive and well. And yet we're doing a life review. And and the theme that's been popping up is this person is either depressed or is super stuck in life. And so the angels are showing them scenes from their life where they've been helpful, where the small kindness and, and a mark of gratitude, something like that really paid off. And the person, if they're open to it, the first dream I had, the person was really open to it. And one of the angels turned to him and this beautiful rainbow of like pink light went from the angel's heart into the man's heart. And and the human said to me, the the real the real person, the other soul travel dreamer next to me, he said, oh, this is good. This doesn't happen a lot. And I said, what doesn't? And he said, the transference of healing energy. And I said, who would reject that? And he said, oh, we humans are stubborn sons of bitches. <laughs> and then I woke up. But I have had other dreams where we'll do that life review with a living person and they'll be like, yeah, but that didn't mean anything. Yeah, that didn't matter to that person. Or, well, that person and I don't even talk anymore. So what does that matter? And I knew what that guy was talking about. We are kind of stubborn. But usually that transference of healing energy happens. And so I just think that something is changing where we are starting to be more open and receptive to this idea of individual healing. Because, I mean, you know, if one person heals... You know, it's it's like the whole hundredth monkey theory, right? If if one of us heals, we help another person heal, and then it's a domino effect, and suddenly all our lights are turned on, and all this all this craziness we've been experiencing in the world starts to heal. You are sending chills down my spine because you just defined what we've been doing for now thirteen months on Sunday nights called Healing Convergence, where we get together on our Facebook Live and then on the podcast the. Uh, Fun Astrology podcast page on YouTube. <laughs> you get all that out. And we do exactly that, healing ourselves first and then out to the world. And it has been absolutely amazing. And that's what works in finding that community. I really feel that right now more than ever, we have to find our spiritual tribe. And I'm so grateful that you're offering that to people. Because, you know, some some of your listeners, my I live in a town that just does not accept what we, you and I talk about, right? Like, if I lived where you live up in the mountains, I would walk around being like, hi, my name is Samantha Fay. I'm an intuitive. But where I live, no, no. <laughs> yeah, Asheville is very permissive in that area, fortunately. So that's good. And there's, I it guess, is. enough it's spillover. It's very, very welcoming. But there are lots of towns where it's not, where there just isn't anything local for people to go to, to feel that sense of community with like-minded people. So it's great that now we can, we can go on Facebook live. We can go on an online zoom class. I think it's just a wonderful thing. Well, and what I love too, again, all the way back to the beginning and your story of talking about doing this in your home, as you were doing life as a mom of three kids and a wife and a pet sitter, (laughs) a pet provider, you were doing, and All of the things that goes with that, which is very much the reality of a lot of people listening to this podcast, and yet you found the time, you carved out the space, even if it was a little table, and you did the thing every day, and the universe met you where you were. 
think that yes. is so cool. I do too. And I think it's great for people to remember that, that the universe will always meet you where you are on your path. And so if you're only ready for one or two enlightened thoughts a day, that's all they're going to give you. But if you are ready for a whole lot more, that's what you will get. But I think it's important for us to take this journey slowly, don't you? Because it can be overwhelming. I think anytime we go through a spiritual awakening, whether it's during the day or in your dreams, it's a beautiful process, but it can be a very overwhelming process. People need to take their time. They really do. They need to They need to take it step by step. And I think it's so important to just not judge anyone else where they are on their path of their own personal journey. We're all, there's many, many paths to home and we're all going to get there in our own way. You know, I, I would love to go back to that moment when you were in the little chapel and you were making your deal with God. If my husband lives, I will move forward with this. So as you moved forward and just in the context of what you're talking about, what was that growth timeline like for you to expand this work from one dream about a neck to what you're doing today? Well, the growth timeline worked really based on on synchronicity because what what happened was he was in rehab for a long time learning how to walk and talk again. And so I couldn't really uphold my end of the bargain with God for a while. I needed to be there for him. But once he came home, I did commit to investing in a babysitter and taking that time for myself to go to an intuitive development class. And I am not the type of girl who shows up alone to stuff. I am that annoying friend who will call you and say, well, just come with me. You can leave early, but I hate showing up to stuff alone. But I did. I just went to this workshop. I didn't know a soul. There was a lovely teacher there and we all created this wonderful community. And so I studied with them for a year and then some friends of mine from that class, we created our own group called the Seekers and we studied together for another year. And then what I did was the uh, owner of a local metaphysical store was like, you know, you're pretty good at this. You should, you should come work here. And I was like, oh no, no, no. So I just gave her my name and number and I said, I am, I am open to doing free readings. And so I did free practice readings for a year remotely from my home because I was too nervous to sit across from someone and, and do that. So it took me three years of solid study, research and practice before I even did this, you know, really on my own. Um, and, and I don't know that I can even say like, here's my timeline. Cause I feel like I'm still learning and growing and there's still so much for me to, to really figure out. Are you doing readings today? I'm not currently right now. I, I took a break to write the book and now I'm working on a next follow-up project. So once all of that comes down, I would go back to it, but right now I'm taking a break. And then how do people find you on social media? I'm at Samantha O'Fay on Instagram, and you can find us on Facebook just by searching Psychic Teachers or Enlightened Empaths. All right. Excellent. You are a treasure trove. Please let this not be our last interview together. No, we and we can't wait to have you on our show. I'm looking forward to it as well. And <laughs> that's going to be a great time to just obviously let your audience know of what's going on around here. But I am so glad that you reached out to me. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. I know well, people are you. going to want to pick up this book, The Awake Dreamer, Samantha Fay, F-E-Y. Keep in touch, please, because... I think this has been one of the most interesting and best interviews that we've done on this podcast in 10 years. Oh, wow. That is high praise. Thank you, because I love your podcast, and I really appreciate that, and I appreciate all the work you're doing. Yeah. Thank you so much, and thank you for contributing to it. Thank you. If you'd like to follow Samantha Fay, she's on Instagram, Samantha O. Fay, F-E-Y. The book again, The Awake Dreamer, A Guide to Lucid Dreaming, Astral Travel, and Mastering the Dreamscape. And again, her name is spelled Samantha F-E-Y. And we'll be hearing more from her in the future, no doubt. So, with that said, sweet dreams and enjoy the journey. <laughs>